Good afternoon, dear students. Uh, today we continue our cycle of lectures from discipline Propedeutics of Internal Medicine for third year students, and this lecture is for MA groups who have a second semester or third of third year. Uh, I remind you that we continue cycle of lectures uh, about uh, signs and symptoms of GI system disorders. And topic of our today's lecture is syndromes of motor function disturbances of esophagus, stomach, small and large intestine. And I remind you that my name is uh, Dr. Maria Brinza. Uh, I'm a head of Department of Propedeutics of Internal Medicine and Physical Rehabilitation. Uh, let's start our work for today. Plan of our today's lecture. Uh, before all, uh, I want to remind you on the picture the anatomy of GI tract. Uh, you see that it includes uh, esophagus, it includes stomach, intestine that consists of small and a large intestine, uh, and uh, additionally it contains pancreas, liver, gallbladder. Uh, and today I'm going to discuss with you a motor dysfunction of uh, empty organs like esophagus, uh, and first uh, part of lecture will be about esophagus uh, motility disorders. Uh, next part of lecture will be about stomach motility disorders. And uh, the last one about intestine, small and large intestine motility disorders. Let's give a definition. What is esophagus motility disorders? And esophageal motility disorders are any medical disorders causing difficulty in swallowing, regurgitation of food, and spasm type pain, which can be brought by an allergic reaction on certain foods. The most prominent one is dysphagia. It may be a part of Crest syndrome. Uh, please remember this name because uh, you will meet it uh, further in uh, gastroenterology. It refers to a five main features. It is calcinosis, renal phenomenon, esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly, and teleangiectasia. It is such a polysystemic disorder with, uh, with these uh, symptoms. Uh, here you see an X-ray picture. Uh, it is barium contrast X-ray. Uh, you remember from methods of examination uh, and diagnostic tests uh, that X-ray uh, can be uh, done with a contrast. And here it is a barium contrast that patients swallow. Uh, and on X-ray uh, photos uh, we see uh, this uh, contrast of barium into the empty organ and especially here it is an esophagus and here you see a critical narrowing of esophagus according to this picture it is a typical picture of acalasia it is a, such a disorder of esophagus uh, here we should note that the broad brick appearance of the lower esophageal sphincter or LES, please remember this name, uh, we will meet it during today's lecture, uh, with a dilated barium filled esophagus proximal to it. Uh, it is a narrowing which we named achalasia, and above this narrowing, uh, the esophagus is dilated and full of contrast, full of uh, contents. Types of esophagus motility disorders. Uh, esophagia could be uh, for solid only and solid and liquid food. Solid dysphagia is due to obstruction such as esophageal cancer, webs or stricture. Solid plus liquid dysphagia is due to esophageal motility disorder or dysmotility, either upper esophagus like neasthenia gravis, stroke or dermatomyositis, or lower esophagus like systemic sclerosis, Crest syndrome from the previous slide, which includes calcinosis, renal phenomenon, esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly, and teleangiectasia, or it can be achalasia. You remember uh, X-ray picture. 
Uh, and here, uh, X-ray of the same patient uh, with response to amyl nitrate uh, drug. It is a smooth mother renaxant. After we give patient uh, this renaxant, you see that narrowing became uh, a, a little bit wider. It is a reduction of achalasia. Uh, here we see a partial relaxation of lower esophageal sphincter that allows some barium to pass through uh, into the stomach. Causes of esophageous motility disorders. Uh, they can be primary or secondary uh, of some systemic disorders. Primary, uh, it is an achalasia, you see, you saw on picture of this spasm. It can be diffuse as a fragile spasm, is achalasia is local spasm, it can be diffuse as a fragile spasm, and it can be eosinophilic as of fragitis, the inflammation, uh, which is such intensive that can uh, thicken uh, walls of esophageus and narrowing, uh, seriously narrowing an esophageal uh, structure. Uh, and secondary to systemic disorders, uh, it can be most often due to systemic sclerosis, due to Chagas disease, and other more rare systemic uh, disorders. Uh, here you see as of a gram of 65-year-old man with a rapid onset dysphagia over one year. Although as of, uh, as of a gram shows a typical picture of achalasia. This patient had adenocarcinoma of the gastroesophageal junction. This is an example of pseudoachalasia, which reinforces the absolute need to esophageal gastroduodenoscopy in patients with radiologic diagnosis of achalasia. Symptoms of esophageous motility disorders. Uh, according to picture, uh, one of the most often it is feeling like something in your throat, that uh, something abnormal here. It can be difficult to swallow in liquids or solid according to what type of dysphagia. Uh, it can be regurgitation or returning food and uh, liquids uh, from the stomach. It can be heartburn, it can be chest pain, uh, can be atypical chest discomfort. Uh, usual for such patient uh, are vomiting, a sensation of something getting stuck, and in a chronic form it is weight loss. And one more picture for you with esophagus. Uh, it is a barium contrast, contrast esophagram demonstrating the crock screw esophagus picture observed in patient with manometry confirmed findings of diffuse esophageal spasm. Uh, it is a, uh, in such way it looks diffuse esophageal spasm. Uh, diagnosis of esophageous motility disorders. Uh, it based uh, in patients with primary motility disorder results of physical examination and often are unrevealing. Uh, uh, clinical signs of scleroderma in the proper clinical settings must be noted, uh, especially skin changes. Bedside swallowing challenge may be performed with a glass of water. Uh, check general nutrition and hydration if significant dysphagia is reported. Uh, here one more esophagram. Uh, it is uh, the same patient with previous picture uh, and response to amyl nitrate. You remember it is relaxant of smooth muscles uh, with disappearance of diffuse spasm on esophagram. Uh, how we usually uh, check for uh, motility disorders of esophagus? Uh, the most usable test is esophageal manometry. Esophageal manometry testing, otherwise known as motility testing, is used to evaluate the narrow muscular functions of the esophagus. And you see on the picture that it is a thin catheter that uh, go through the nose uh, to the esophagus and it is uh, finished and stomach. It lived for some time, usually during night. Uh, and in the different levels, uh, it 
can uh, it can miss you a pressure uh, and uh, let's continue next part of our today's lecture is stomach motility disorders a gastric motility disorders are any alterations in the transit of foods and secretions into the digestive tract by the types uh, it is a uh, delayed gastric emptying or named uh, the situation gastroparesis. Another type, it is a rapid gastric emptying, uh, the opposite situation with uh, too high a motility uh, or we name it dumping syndrome. It can be functional dyspepsia when we can't confirm any organic problems but patient have, uh, has symptomatic it can be idiopathic vomiting and cyclic vomiting syndrome. Uh, they will stop on each form. Uh, stomach motility disorders. Uh, in general, uh, they can be caused by uh, most often diabetes due to ne diabetic neuropathy. Uh, it can be due to infections, due to other endocrine disorders, uh, mostly uh, due to hypothyroidism. Uh, the result of it can be a connective tissue disorder too, not just for esophagus, for stomach too. It is scleroderma, autoimmune conditions, neuromuscular diseases. A lot of patients uh, have an unknown cause, we can't find any cause of uh, stomach motility disorders. And uh, we name this form idiopathic. Uh, more rare, uh, different psychological conditions, acute and chronic stress, and psychiatric disorders can lead to stomach motility problems, uh, eating disorders, uh, certain cancers, radiation treatment applied over the chest or abdomen, some chemotherapy agents, surgery of the upper intestinal tract. Uh, and I uh, promised you to stop on different forms. First form, it is during delayed gastric emptying or gastroparesis. Poor emptying of the stomach can occur for several, several reasons. First, the outlet of the stomach, the pillarus and duodenum, may be obstructed by an ulcer or a tumor or by something large and indigestible that was swallowed. The pyloric sphincter uh, at the exist of stomach may not open enough of the right times to allow food pass through. The normally rhythmic three times per minute contractions of the lower part of the stomach can become disorganized uh, so that the contents of the stomach are not pushed toward the pyloric sphincter. Uh, here you see uh, pictures with the different diagnostic procedures for gastroparesis. Uh, on the first picture, A, it is radiological and endoscopic findings delayed gastric emptying. Uh, on A, it is simple abdominal x-ray shows a dilated stomach with food material. Yes, it's not very visible, but if you pay attention to the picture A, uh, you see that uh, uh, stomach is enlarged and contains a lot of uh, liquid. Uh, on uh, picture B, it is severe stenosis of anastomosis site after bilirat 1 gastrododenoscopy. It is a iatrogenic post-operational complication uh, with obstruction of uh, uh, gastrododenal junction. Yes, and you see on picture B how a narrow, a small uh, uh, how a small uh, disconnection is between uh, stomach and intestine. Opening uh, is seen in the inferior direction of anastomosis site. Uh, on picture C, it is endoscopic view of gastroduodenostomy stenosis undergoing by balloon dilation. On picture C, we see treatment of this situation with balloon dilation of this narrowing, of this obstruction. Uh, here is luminal narrowing is seen due to anastomotic stenosis. Balloon dilation by uh, different pressure, usually it used 20, 25 and up to 30 PCI, uh, was done for 2 minutes. They developed no complications such as bleeding due to procedure. Widening of stenosis site can be seen. Uh, 
uh, next uh, situation the opposite if uh, previous situation it was too slow uh, emptying here is too rapid emptying of stomach or rapid gastric empty or dumping syndrome rapid gastric emptying happens when the upper end of small intestine which uh, this part we name you you know fills too quickly with undigested food from the stomach it can be early and late form Early dumping begins during the right after a meal and late dumping happens one to three hours after eating. Many patients have both type as symptoms uh, features of uh, early form as features of uh, late form. Uh, schematically it looks like this that uh, food from the stomach uh, without normal complete digestion too quickly goes to the urine duodenum and urinum. Uh, next form it is functional dyspepsia. I told you several words that uh, it is a functional disorder so we will learn uh, several uh, different types of functional disorders in GI tract and one of it functional dyspepsia. What means functional in general? It means that uh, during investigation of patient we can't find any objective cause. We can see it, we can uh, feel it by our arms, we can see it on a visualization test, it will be no changes in lab tests, but patient has uh, a symptomatic symptomal complexes. Uh, that's why uh, we can't say that it is okay with the patient because it presents symptoms and we have to treat it but on the other hand it is no objective uh, features of these disorders at all. This group of diseases we name functional and uh, what I'm going to discuss with you today it is functional dyspepsia. Many patients have pain or discomfort, what I told you, it is subjective symptoms of patients. Usually they feel fullness, only satiety or feeling full soon after starting to eat. Bloating, nausea, uh, that is felt in the center of the abdomen above the belly button. There is no single motility disorder that explains all these symptoms, but about a third of patients with these symptoms have dilated gastric emptying, usually not so severe that it causes frequent vomiting, and about a third show a failure of relaxation of the upper stomach. Following a swallow, it is an abnormal gastric accommodation reflex. About half of the patients of these symptoms also have sensitive or irritable stomach, which causes sensations of discomfort when the stomach is filled with, uh, with even small volumes. Uh, main pathophysiological mechanisms that together uh, lead to functional dyspepsia include visceral hypersensitivity, uh, disrupted gut immune interaction, abnormal upper GI motor reflex and functions. Uh, here is important different psychosocial factors, yes, psychological, uh, psychological uh, state of uh, the patient. Uh, it possible uh, play, play its role uh, genetic factors and altered brain-gut interactions. Next disorder we name cycling vomiting syndrome. Cycling vomiting syndrome is a disorder with a recurrent episode of severe nausea and vomiting, inter uh, interpersed with symptoms free periods. Cycling vomiting syndrome occurs in all ages. Patients may struggle for many years before a correct diagnosis is made. Uh, general symptoms for all stomach motility disorders let's discuss. Uh, often uh, it can be nausea and vomiting, it can be rachy or dry heavies, it can be bloating, you see on the picture, uh, that how enlarged can be abdomen. Uh, it can be upper abdominal pain and uh, other locations, it can be irradiation to other parts of abdomen. It can be stomach fullness after normal sized meal. It can be early fullness or satiety with the inability to finish a meal. 
and it is weight loss due to a decreased appetite. Uh, gastric motility procedure. Uh, for checking a gastric motility, uh, we have uh, we can do different tests, and mo most uh, uh, informative for us uh, it is a checking pressure with smart pill wireless motility capsule. It is a pill size sensor that is swallowed and measures temperature, pH, pressure, how quickly the stomach empties, how quickly the small intestine and colon empty. More often, uh, it have been uh, must be done Helicobacter or H. pylori testing uh, with a blood antibody test, breath test, stool antigen test, or stomach biopsy. One of these tests can be used for confirming or not confirming Helicobacter pylori infection. Breath testing uh, that can help detect a food intolerance, bacterial overgrowth, irritable bowel syndrome or IBS, fructose intolerance, lactose intolerance, and constipation. Uh, in such way, it looks a uh, smart pill wireless motility capsule. Uh, it capsule like a big tablet uh, that uh, contain two parts. External part, uh, it is a capsule which is individual, of course, for any patient. And internal parts with the sensors and with the camera uh, that fix and uh, send uh, information to the computer or smartphone uh, of the doctor. And uh, patient just drink uh, this capsule uh, and uh, all these parameters are fixed during going capsule through the GI of the patient. Each pillary testing, uh, the most simple test, it is uh, testing uh, with each pillary strips. Uh, it is uh, uh, easy even individually for patient. It can be done even without uh, medical workers. Uh, and uh, you need just buffer and strips. And in 10 minutes, like for pre pregnancy, we can uh, check is it positive or negative for each pillary. Uh, breathing test. Uh, it uh, based on uh, concentration of urea in the uh, breathe, uh, breathe out air. Yes, uh, we know that uh, during its uh, cycle of life, H. pylori bacteria produce an uh, urea and urease, uh, and it goes to the air in the lungs. And in a uh, breast air, we, uh, according to concentration of urea, uh, we can confirm presence of Helicobacter pylori infections. Uh, okay, and third part of our today's lecture it is intestine motility disorders. First of all, uh, let's give a general definition to these disorders. A phrase intestinal motility disorders applies to abnormal intestinal contractions such as spasm and intestinal paralysis. In this phrase, it used to describe a variety of disorders in which uh, the gut has lost in its ability to coordinate muscular activity because of endogenous or exogenous causes. Uh, uh, according to mechanisms, uh, it is first of all it connected to this control of gut motility by the interactions between extrinsic neural pathways and intrinsic nervous system, and when it's affected uh, affected these interactions between uh, int extrinsic neural pathways and intrinsic nervous system uh, that innervate GI tract innervate intestine, it can lead to uh, different intestine motility disorders. Uh, main causes. Uh, main causes uh, uh, it can be multifactorial in most patients. Only few have been detected. Uh, first of all, it is de degenerative disorders caused pseudo-obstruction along with other problems. 
uh, drugs that are commonly used uh, here uh, play its role three cyclic uh, three, three cyclic antidepressants, diuretics, laxatives, or have some specific uh, indications like lithium salts, vinca alkaloids, and uh, other chemotherapy agents. Uh, uh, they may interfere with each other with intestinal motility. Uh, different endocrine disorders like myxedema most often you remember it refers to hypothyroidism. It can also uh, cause pseudo obstruction. And different genetic factors can uh, be a causes of motility disorders of intestine. Uh, manifestations. It can be abdominal distension, it can be recurrent obstruction, severe abdominal colic pain, severe constipation, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, and intractable recurrent vomiting. Uh, and uh, here you see table about constipation. Uh, I included for the guidelines from uh, Yeah Medicine and Medscape. Uh, because constipation it is one of the most often in all world motility disorders in old and all adult population. Uh, that's why here I include 15 causes of constipation that can play its role in motility disorders too. It is poor diet, it is lack of exercise, medications, uh, underactive thyroid, it is uh, irritable bowel syndrome or IBS. Uh, it can be due to perianal pain in different perianal diseases, neurological conditions. When patients drink not enough water, when it is poor tolerant toilet habits, when, uh, during acute or chronic stress, uh, laxative abuse, bowel cancer, uh, pity training and uh, traveling, and of course pregnancy. Uh, clinical signs of intestine motility disorders can go with uh, intestinal pseudo obstruction or Ogilev syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome or IBS, we usually use this term, fecal intolerance or constipation. Uh, which, what uh, methods of examination we can use additionally to objective examination to confirm intestine motility disorders. Here you see example of such test. It is endoscopic ultrasound. And here we can see anterior defect uh, in internal and external and anal sphincter. Uh, we can classify intestine motility disorders according to a specific classification that which named uh, nose mountain classification. Uh, it divide all motility, intestine motility disorders to delaying colonic transit with a slow transit constipation like enteric neuropathy, enteric myopathy, Parkinson's disease, endocrine disorders and spinal injury. Uh, it can be dilated colon, diffuse or segmented. Uh, it refers to Ogilvy uh, syndrome and megacolon. And it can be absent rectal anal inhibitory reflex or Hirschsprung disease. Another method, method includes gastrointestinal scintigraphy. Uh, uh, here on the picture in these two hour images uh, not the normal empty. It is nearly 51% empty. Normal range is from 31 to 67%. In the left image is significantly more tracer shown on the smaller small intestine than in the right image which shows delayed empty. Here just 27 26% empty and much less tracer in the intestine. Uh, clinical symptoms of intestine motility disorders uh, include pain, bloating, disturbed bowel motion, feeling full after having eaten only a small amount, uh, it usual nausea, uh, it can be even a vomiting and severe constipation. And please uh, look at the picture on this slide, why I include it. 
uh, of property tax we uh, do not uh, learn a treatment of uh, different disorders but it's very easy uh, one of the most easiest for functional disorders and here goes on the first place uh, lifestyle modification and one of the most important and one of the most effective ways to treatment of intestinal motility disorders it is regular physical activity and here you see an example that just 30 minutes uh, jogging uh, yeah, three times a week is very effective way of treatment and prophylactic of all types of intestinal motility disorder uh, okay let's return to diagnostics uh, here you see endoscopy on the first picture with a placement of guy wire for motility catheter and uh, the same situation by uh, through the another methodic uh, it is uh, x-ray picture we see the same catheter but not endoscopically through the x-ray with the uh, placement of colonic motility catheter with checking according by this catheter of pressure in the colon uh, physical examination of patient with intestinal motility disorders. Clinical picture of patients with intestinal motility disorders is protein, uh, protein and may vary greatly depending on specific condition present. Always perform a digital rectal air examination. It is very important for all GI patients in any patient with intestinal motility disorder to detect a presence of mass like this is tumor or foreign body or blood in the rectum. Uh, one more methodic, it is X-ray methodic too. We name it defectography. And uh, uh, by the contrast, we see uh, on the first picture anterior rectus sene. Uh, and a second picture after the time, after the uh, test with uh, drugs, we see that this anterior rectus sene does not empty according to movements of uh, bowel. Uh, and uh, one, uh, two more syndromes that I'm going to discuss with you today, but they are very, very important. Uh, and we will meet, we will return further to these syndromes. It is syndromes of mild digestion and mild absorption. Uh, let's give definition. What is that? Mild digestion uh, describes the inability of an individual to digest food in the gut. Malabsorption is the inability to absorb nutrients which have been digested from food through the gut. Uh, what uh, uh, organs and system can be damaged uh, by maldigestion and malabsorption? Uh, primarily, nearly all systems, nearly all organs. Uh, uh, can be affected uh, by abnormal digestion and abnormal absorption of nutrients. It is sperm, it is uh, egg, pancreas, muscles, heart, blood, brain, lung, bone, liver, kidney and all other organ and system. That's why this problem is very important. Causes of maldigestion and malabsorption include congenital heart disease, uh, cystic fibrosis, gastroenteritis, HIV infection, liver disease, short bowel syndrome, toddler's diarrhea, etc. Uh, clinical manifestations uh, can be GI manifestation, GI symptoms and non-GI symptoms. Gastrointestinal uh, features include diarrhea, steatorrhea, weight loss, flatulence, pain, abdominal bloating, abdominal cramps, abdominal discomfort, swelling or edema, and muscle cramps. It is the most often. Uh, and on histological examination, uh, we can see different features, different uh, presentations of uh, mild digestion and mild absorption according to uh, according to cause uh, it can be different microscopic picture and main of these variants you see on the picture 
and it can be extra intestinal manifestations, non-GI symptoms. Patients with celiac disease present with anemia and osteopenia in the absence of classic GI symptoms. A microcytic and macrocytic or demorphic anemia may reflect impaired iron, folate or vitamin B12 absorption. Purpura subconjunctival hemorrhage may reflect hypoprotrombin amine secondary to vitamin K malabsorption. Osteopenia is common, especially in the presence of steatorrhea, impaired calcium and vitamin D absorption and chelation of calcium by unabsorbed fatty acids, resulting in fecal loss of calcium may all contribute. Sorry, then not all. Dermatitis and peripheral neuropathy uh, may be caused by malabsorption of specific vitamins or micronutrients and essential fatty acids. Uh, here you see a mechanism of uh, B12 deficiency uh, due to malabsorption or, and maldigestion of vitamin B12. Uh, you know it from the physiology, it's just reminding you that it takes uh, part uh, internal, uh, internal castle factor uh, that affected uh, digestion and after it affected absorption of vitamin B12. Abnormal digestion and absorption lead to deficit it in the blood to the abnormal erythropoiesis and it can lead to anemia. Uh, uh, complications. Both maldigestion and malabsorption can lead to deficiencies, for example, in vitamins and minerals, as well as protein and energy. Uh, the complications uh, that can develop uh, depend upon which nutrients are affected. For example, a calcium and vitamin D deficit can lead to rickets and osteopenia. Iron deficiency is associated with anemia. Zinc deficiency has been linked to poor growth. Problems with absorbing protein, fats and carbohydrates can accumulate in weight loss and undernutrition with wasting and in severe cases stunting. Uh, and here you see uh, problems uh, with malabsorption of vitamin D, which is uh, critically important in children. Yes, it is affected uh, the growth uh, of the person when it is present the uh, vitamin D deficiency in childhood. It can be abnormal growth. Diagnostics of maldigestion and malabsorption. There is no single specific test. A range of different conditions can produce maldigestion, malabsorption, and it's necessary to look on each of these speci speci specifically. Many tests have been advocated, and some, such as tests for pancreatic function, are complex, vary between centers, and have not been widely adopted. Tests are also needed to detect the systemic effects of deficiency of the malabsorbed nutri nutrients, such as anemia with vitamin B12 malabsorption. And here, schematically, the mechanism of malabsorption. Uh, you see that it is uh, on the epithelium of uh, the intestine. Uh, it is abnormal uh, absorption of uh, nutrients to the capillaries through the microvilli. Uh, okay, blood tests. Uh, what can we find interesting in blood? Uh, in blood tests, a patient with maldigestion and malabsorption. Routine blood test may reveal anemia, high CRP, and low albumin. Uh, microcytic anemia usually implies iron deficiency and macrocytosis can be caused by impaired folic and B12 absorption or both. Low cholesterol or three glyceride may give a clue to what fat malabsorption. Low calcium and phosphate may give a clue to what osteomalacia from low vitamin D. 
specific vitamins like vitamin D uh, or micronutrient like zinc levels can be checked. Fat soluble vitamins like A, D, E and K are affected in fat malabsorption. Prolonged protrombin-10 can be caused by vitamin K deficiency. Immunoglobulin A, antitransglutaminase antibodies or immunoglobulin A anti endomysial antibodies for celiac disease or we name it gluten-sensitive enteropathy. Uh, here you see a scheme of fat malabsorption. Uh, according to causes, it can be lymphatic obstruction, reduced small intestinal surface, or it can be iatrogenic. And causes allergic or xenophilic for lymphatic or reduced small surface uh, tuberculosis or tuberculosis lymphadenitis. And iatrogenic, it usually goes with short gut syndromes. And schematically, how it goes. Uh, stool tests. Microscopy is particularly useful in diarrhea. Uh, may show protozoa like Giardia, Ola, Cyst, and other infective uh, other infective agents. Fecal fat study or diagnostiatory is rarely performed nowadays. Low fecal pancreatic anastase is indicative of pancreatic insufficiency. Chemotrypsin and uh, pancrea, uh, pancreal laureal can be accessed as well. And here you see schematically diarrhea and malabsorption. As a result of diarrhea, malabsorption can be in different parts of intestine from the urinal, ileum, sacrum, proximal and distal colon or all, uh, all length of uh, intestine. Uh, and according to uh, in which uh, uh, in which part of intestine it some uh, dis something disturbs, it is a different mucosal resistance. It is spontaneous PD and a different absorptive mechanisms, which can be uh, disturbed and lead to malabsorption different nutrients. And for your individual work for today, I have a USML E test. A 22-year-old female presents to your office with a gas, abdominal distension and explosive diarrhea. She normally enjoys uh, eating cheese but has been experiencing this symptom after eating it for the past few months. She has uh, otherwise been entirely well except a few days of nausea, diarrhea and uh, vomiting earlier uh, in uh, the year from which she recovered without treatment. Uh, which of the following laboratory findings would you expect to find during workup of this patient? First option – decreased stool osmolar gap. Second – decreased stool pH. Third, positive fecal smear for leukocyte. Uh, fourth, positive stool culture for rotavirus. And fifth, a positive stool culture for trip, uh, trophenema Ripley. Uh, it one more time for your individual look. I uh, do not need uh, the obligatory answer. Uh, if you attentively listen to, to today's lecture uh, for yourself, you can note the correct answer. And I remind you that uh, everyone who listening the lecture should leave uh, your name and group number in the comments under the video and uh, on YouTube. For today, that's all. See you in two weeks when we continue GI cycle of lecture uh, and we will have one more interesting 